So I'm going to introduce Lynn Wilkinson, and she's with Draco, Draco Designs, and she is going to tell us how to design the home for aging in place. She specializes in this, and she works with the National Home Builders Association, and she's also an instructor in this area of adaptation of the home. So please welcome Lynn Wilkinson. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good. How many of you are already experiencing your caregiver situation? Maybe your parents are still living in their house, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. They can't get around. They f you feel like their safety may be at risk because of things that are going on. And so we're seeing in the design community issues with this. Uh, to give you a little bit more about myself, like she said, I'm Lynn Wilkinson. I am a registered interior designer and uh, nationally certified in all this. So this is something I live and breathe. Where I really started to get an interest in the aging in place is I've had four knee surgeries and two knee replacements. And y'all know, man, when that starts to happen, you look at stairs a whole new way. <laughs> they take on a completely different appearance. And so you see these things going on. I'm, I'm my family, we're lucky that the brains are staying intact, but the bodies are failing. And so the physical environment is really something we're looking at. And it's not just in my family. Chris, my little human clicker back there. The world is getting older. The world is getting a lot older. Uh, there's about 8 billion people on the planet, going to be hitting 9 billion not too far away. And to give you an idea, this is a global concern. The design community is woefully behind in catching on to what is going on. Uh, most of the changes happening in the design community are coming from old designers and old architects. And we're starting to go, uh oh, 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 what's going on here? So the planet, for an example, in China, China has 178 million people over the age of 60. That is more than the entire population of Russia. That's huge. And so between 2000 and 2025, and we're past the halfway mark to getting to 2025, in the United States, we're going to go to almost 25% over, over the age of 60. Anybody here over the age of 60? Stuff breaks. It just, and it doesn't, you wake up with a pulled muscle and you didn't do anything. And so things are starting to break. So do you think the physical world is ready for that? Do you have steps getting into your house? Yeah, something even as simple as that. In Europe, they're going to be almost 29% over the age of 60. Asia, over at 25%. So think about that. In just a few short years, in about seven years, one fourth of the populations of all of the first industrialized nations and a good portion of the second and third nations are going to be over the age of 60. Built world's not ready for this. So right now what we're looking at are sustainable aging societies. Chris, could I have go to the next slide please? Sustainable aging societies were not addressing this in just about every industry. It's not just the design construction industry, just about every product manufacturers, nobody's really paying attention to this. And one of the big things is that massive housing industry, specifically the single family home. How many of y'all live in a single family home? How many of your parents live in a single family home? That could be a problem because the fact is 25% so more than 60, 20, anywhere from 25 to 60% of the homes being built right now, today, will have a resident living in that house in the lifetime of the house with severe mobility impairment, impairment during that lifetime. That's huge. So basically what we're saying is almost all the houses that are being built are going to have somebody with a mobility issue living in them. And the problem is none of them have accessibility unless it's a custom-built home. And so we're not seeing that. So what's going to lead to are hideously expensive renovations. And even if a renovation is possible, sometimes it's just not even possible to do. You just have to move over and start over. And just things like being able to use the house. I was talking to some of the facilities out there that are doing the assisted care. And they are wonderful, lovely facilities. I might move into some of those right now. But the thing is, I said, what's the number one reason why a lot of your people are moving into those? And they said, because their house doesn't work. So people are ending up in facilities a lot earlier. And we know for a fact 
that if you can stay in familiar surroundings, if you do have the things like Alzheimer's and dementia and things like that, you can function longer and better. So we know that for a fact. So in the United States, we have federal accessibility laws. Anybody here of ADA? Okay. We've had the ADA now for a couple of decades. And the problem is the ADA only applies to public buildings, not single family homes, not private residences. Uh, they're for multifamily dwellings. You do have some of the fair housing. So the FHA does have some rules for that. And so we, in the United States, the, the organization called the Access Board, or their full name is the U.S. Architectural Transportation Barriers Compliance Board. That's why we just call it the Access Board. And so they're the ones that actually do the guidelines. And so the Access Board, they make all of these documents available for free. How many of you have started buying books? Your caregivers, you've started buying books, maybe modification for accessibilities. And those are expensive books. They're good books, but they're expensive. For free, you can go on the ADA website, and you can go through and get a free PDF version of the accessibility guidelines. Now, granted, these are for commercial buildings, but they do have fabulous things in there on how to build a ramp, what you need to construct, that how the, all that has to work, doorways, structure, all of those things in there. There's a lot of things in here that work. The FHA, which is the Fair Housing Guideline, Accessibility Guideline, um, they have two chapters. One is on kitchens and one is on bathrooms. And the one on bathrooms is great because this is the only document that I have ever found that actually explains how to do proper blocking for grab bars. It is not in the ADA. It is not in the National Home Builders Certified Aging in Place. None of that. So that's the only place you can go to learn how to actually do it correctly. Now, when it comes to all of this, and in human ergonomics or human ergonomics, so whether it's commercial or residential, it applies. So there's a lot of terms flying around out there, and you've probably heard some of these things. Uh, universal design, accessible design, visitable design, multi-generational design, inclusive design. It gets a little confusing, doesn't it? Basically, it's just building spaces that everyone can use, regardless of age, regardless of physical ability, anything like that. So this sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? Why isn't this standard? Why isn't the building industry and the home building industry looking at this, especially when you look at that huge silver tsunami that's about ready to crash down on all of us? And so the biggest reason is because they're not being made to. Remember, the only laws and the only enforceable codes for access do not apply to single family homes. And do you think the builders are gonna do that until they're forced to do it? Yeah, <laughs> they're not gonna take that on. So we're seeing this. Now we're starting to see some changes coming along. And one of the ways that is changing, how we think about accessible single family homes, actually started in the United States in Atlanta. And this is the concept of visitability. And visitability is similar to universal design in the general intention. But it is much more focused in the scope on social reform. So we're seeing universal design. You can get guidelines for universal design if you're making a custom home or renovating. But visitability is actually a social movement that's starting as a grassroots movement in this country because so many of you are having to deal with houses that don't work. And so it's not a federal requirement, but what we're seeing is this is coming up from below. This is coming up from the caregivers and coming up from the homeowners. And so a lot of states, a lot of cities, municipalities, they're starting to adopt visitability codes. Now, when they do this, they're doing it for new construction. Because Austin tried to do this, I don't know if you remember, a few years ago, they were trying to implement some visitability codes, but they were going to make it for all houses, and you couldn't sell your house if it wasn't compliant. Yeah, that got shot down real hard. <laughs> but unfortunately, it also shot down new construction. So we're starting to see this. Now, for visitability, there's basically... And each municipality that's starting to adopt it, the state that's starting to adopt it, and they're about a third of the way through the country, they have three primary things. The social reform is that everybody should be able to visit a home and get in it, 
get through it, and use the bathroom. Kind of nice features, right? <laughs> so we're talking about those kind of three things, and everybody's adopting them slightly differently. But these are good guidelines that if you're evaluating a house, if it is usable, these are some things to take a look at. So for example, the zero threshold entry. And the zero threshold entry, every house can use this. It doesn't matter, because think about it. If you have two steps going into a house, and how many of you ever had kids? And you try to get in your house with a stroller, an infant, a toddler, and an armload of groceries, and you had to go up two steps. You probably wanted to kill yourself or them by the time you got inside. So a zero threshold, can it work for somebody that's having mobility, that's on a temporary walker after knee surgery, or that's permanently in a wheelchair? Yeah, big one there. And so we're starting to see how we can do this. Ideally, you want it to be the main entrance because you don't want people to feel that, okay, if you want to come to my house, you have to come in the back door. That doesn't fly very well. So you want it to be the main entrance, but it could be the garage door entrance. And there's a lot of ways to achieve it. Uh, Regrading the yard, so grading the slope a little differently, putting a little bit of a, a cement swell into the, the garage, building a ramp, building a lift, all of those kinds of things can add more access to how you can get in there. Now, one thing I want to talk about is a lot of you have probably had to add ramps or are thinking about adding ramps in that kind of situation so that somebody can get into a house that has steps. Because let me tell you, if you've got steps, it's game over. A lot of times you just can't get in. When I had my knee replacement surgery, I had to stay in the hospital an extra day because I live in a 110-year-old house. And my 110-year-old house is on pier and beam that are about that tall. And I have six humongous steps going up to that house. Their names are pain, agony, suffering, hell, damnation, and oh, Satan. <laughs> I named them all. And so I had to stay in the hospital an extra day so the occupational therapist can specifically show me how to go upstairs that didn't have a railing on crutches, at which point I had to surrender my crutches and immediately go on the walker, because you're not allowed to use crutches if you had knee replacement. And I had to stay in the hospital a day. And my insurance company had to pay for me to stay in the hospital a day to learn how to go upstairs. So these kinds of things, ramp building. Now, if you're building a ramp, if you have a door sill height of 30 inches or less, then you can add a ramp to that house. And the biggest thing you have to remember are the ratios. And you're going to hear that number. And if you're reading things, you'll see this, this 1 to 12. So the ratio is 1 to 12. And it's talking about rise and run. So what it means is basically for every one inch up, the ramp has to go 12 inches out so that you have a gradual enough slope so that grandma doesn't have to go to bodybuilding classes to get that wheelchair up that ramp. So the 1 to 12 ratio is what you need to pay attention to. And then again, next slide, there are some excellent guidelines available for this. This is not rocket science. This is standardized. This is measured. We know exactly how to build a safe ramp. This is free in the ADA. It's in a variety of publications. And so some of the things you want to look at, you want to look at the rise over run. You want to have handrails on this. You want to have handrails that extend beyond the end of the ramp so that somebody can kind of turn around once they get there. If it's a hideously long ramp, you need to put leveled off spots so that somebody that's going up there can stop and rest and then go on the next leg of the ramp. You also want to put curbs. Y'all, I have seen ramps. Church youth groups love to help build ramps. And I don't know if they're trying to drum up funeral business, but I, <laughs> I have seen some bad things, you know. And so people think of the ramp, they get the rise and run right, the slope right. But you also want to have the curb because if one wheel goes off the edge, it's never going to end well for any of us, is it? No. So that's something to consider. If your porch entry or your entry is higher than 30 inches, then you want to go and use a lift. And these are available. A lot of manufacturers are selling these. Uh, and that's when you have those really high ones, because otherwise your entire front yard and half of your neighbors would have to be ramp when you're looking at something. Because think about it, 30 inches up is 30 feet of ramp. It's going to be a serpentine. You're going to look like a carnival thing. Kids are going to be coming over with their skateboards going down these things. And so installing a porch lift, if you do have to put in a lift, there's a couple things to bear in mind. You need a 5x5 five five landing pad at the bottom. It has to have, next slide, it has to have a dedicated circuit. Nope. Oh, sorry, go back one. My bad. 
And Chris is in the back going, yeah, I know. <laughs> it has to have a dedicated circuit. So you're going to have to call the electrician in on this one. You need a continuous space for it to be able to go vertically the whole way up and down with no overhanging porches, nothing sticking out of the side of the house. We don't want them to get halfway up and get clocked in the head. And then you also want to have a gate at the top because, think about it, if the lift is at the bottom and somebody else comes out the top, that's a bad first step. So you want to have a gate there to keep the security. So pretty simple to do. Now, once you get in, thank you, Chris. <laughs> once you get in, Great, you made it to the door. Can you get in? How wide are those doorways? And so when we're talking about doorway width, generally production builders build a house that the front door is three foot, so it's 36 inches. So a 36 inch door is gonna give you about 34 inches of clear opening space. And what we're talking about a clear passage space is if you open that door, ooh, go back one, if you open that door 90 degrees, the thickness of the door is within the opening width of the space, right? And generally doors are an inch and interior doors are about inch and a half, inch and a quarter wide, and you have that little gap for the hinges. So you lose about two inches. So what we're trying to get is a minimum clear width, so a clear opening of 32 inches. If you have a minimum clear opening of 32 inches, you can get wheelchairs through, you can get walkers through, and it's easier to do and get everybody through there. And so a standard 34-inch door hung in a standard fashion, normal hinges, will give you a 32-inch clear opening when that door is 90 inches. Now, the next slide shows you that's a problem sometimes. Sometimes you just need those two inches. Maybe I've got a 32-inch door opening. And in older houses, you have narrower doors. I guess they were skinnier. I don't know. But you got smaller doors or lumber cost more, something, smaller doors. There are these things called offset hinges. And you can buy an offset door hinge, replace the standard hinges on your door, and now your 32-inch door, when it's open, will give you a 32-inch opening. And so something as simple as changing out the hinges can just buy you what you need. You don't have to rip out the whole door jam and go from there. Now, for visitability, they also talk about having at least a usable half bathroom. So if somebody comes to your house, they have a bathroom they can use. And so for visitability, the emphasis is on having that usable half bath. It is not essential, but it is nice if you got a space and you're doing some renovation to think about this thing called the five-foot turning radius. Have Oh, sure. That's me. Great. Thank you. Please. Thank you. What he's passing out to you guys is a handout that has the website locations for the free ADA publications. And I've also called out specific chapters that might be the more helpful ones that you want to look at because it's about that thick. Really good bedtime reading. <laughs> It'll put you out like a light. And so the five-foot turning circle radius, have you all ever seen diagrams and they have that five-foot circle on it? Does anybody know why we use the five foot or the 60 inch turning radius circle? Anybody? Wheelchair. Get in a wheelchair, turn your left hand backward, your right hand forward, and you will need 60 inches to turn it around. And that's why you want to get that 60 inch turning radius of floor space. But you want to have at least a 32 inch clear pathway. Remember that door opening, you get the wheelchair in so that they can at least get in and possibly do a transfer to use this. So, Chris, thank you. However, most people who live in the house, if you actually live in a house, having a toilet you can use is nice. Having to use the kitchen sprayer from the faucet because you can't get upstairs to take a shower is not nice. So, you might want to actually get clean. So, I've shown an image here. This is that typical bathroom. You come in, you've got a sink, you've got a toilet, and you've got a bathtub shower at the end. That's that typical bathroom. Now, maybe you wanna, don't want to do hideously expensive major renovations, but maybe just refitting a bathroom could get you so that you can buy an extra five years in that house. That's a good return on investment. If you take that sink and you move it and put it in the corner, and if you make it wall hung, so nothing on the floor, the foot pedals of the wheelchair can turn underneath that so you can get a little bit tighter on that, move the co commode over, make it an accessible height commode, and you can now have that full turning radius. It's easier to turn, they could transfer for th to the toilet, they can get into the shower. So something as simple as just changing the layout a little 
moving things up off the floor, that can get you there. And then another thing, anybody here ever have to bathe a relative? <laughs> it's, wow, when you're in that position with your parents, it's just, wow. <laughs> but the handheld spray shower, right? Handheld shower head is your best friend. Uh, so sometimes just installing one of these will get you there. But did you know that they make these that they have the on-off switch on the shower head? Aha! That way you don't have to let go of that thing. It's like being in a shower with, with the wet willy hose. Y'all remember that thing with the hose in the backyard? So getting the ones that have a little on-off switch, you can look for those. They're out there. Seating in the bathing area is also incredibly important so that somebody they can take care of themselves. If you can at least get them in there, hand them a handheld shower that they can turn on and off themselves, they can get in there. There are myriad different kinds of seeding products out there. This one has been out for a long time. You can get everything from that kind of institutional, you know the shower chair, right? You can get them with the back, without the back, they're all adjustable. But they also have wall-mounted ones, and you can get the wall-mounted ones that have a fold-down seat so that you have the full space in there. You don't have to worry about where to put this thing when maybe you want to take a shower. So you have all that. And then, of course, if you are doing a full remodel, you can build in the bench seats into the shower area. So having some kind of a seating is critical. And then the other thing I want to talk about are grab bars. This is the first thing people think of, right? When you're making your house more accessible, add grab bars. This has been a huge huge area for product development in recent years. Uh, previously, the only grab bars available were what I call under the category of butt ugly. And I went on a quest. And the name of my quest was the quest for the not butt ugly grab bar. And thank you, they started to develop these things. And they're wonderful, but I in my mind have kind of split two categories. I call these balance assist aids. And you're seeing these things, they've got them for the toilet paper holder, they've got them for the soap holders, you've got ones that look like regular grab bars. But most of the more decorative grab bars have a polished metal finish. Now if you're dealing with somebody that's gonna be lifting their full body weight and really needs grab bars, then all of these meet the ADA requirements. For an ADA requirement for a grab bar, it has to have a 500 pound capacity. And I love to go to trade shows where they have these walls set up. And I look at that and I say, that installation is good for 500 pounds. And the salesman's like, yes, indeed. It's our new installation technology. And I grab a hold of it, pick up my legs, and watch them panic. <laughs> and so 500 pounds is a lot that you're trying to get on these things. And so the balance assist aids, when they're slippery, it's a little more challenging. So if you have somebody that truly if they're gonna be transferring from a wheelchair, they don't have use of their lower body, they're gonna be pulling their full body weight on these, go back to the butt ugly. Make sure you're getting the ones that, this is not completely ugly, but see how it has that diamond cutting in the center section? Or you get the ones that are that kind of dull stainless steel and they have a lot more texture to them. Or the epoxy coated ones, those epoxy coated ones are designed so that as the hand pulls, the water will pull away and it has stick, it has grip. So make sure you're choosing the right kind of grab bar for the right kind of application. And this next one, do not ever put these associations together. Do not put the idea of towels and grab bars together. Because A, people use towel bars as grab bars. This can be quite exciting, because if y'all know, the towel bar cylinders rotate. That can get really fun as you grab a hold of that and spin off and hit the floor. So never, ever, ever think towel bar, grab bar. And don't put towels on a grab bar. I've seen people try to con their moms into this, because mom is totally against having a grab bar, because it's not pretty. And they say, well, we can put it in, and you can use it as a towel bar now, and then when you need it, you'll have it. Don't do that because they start putting towels on there. When they start to slip and fall, they grab the towel. What does the towel do? So at least they have something to cover themselves while waiting for emergency services. So don't make that association. It's a dangerous thing. And the other thing is installing grab bars. Now, ideally, 
If you're doing renovation, put three quarter inch plywood on any wall you're gonna screw anything into. And then you can put the hardy board or the drywall over that. Anything you tooth into a three quarter inch plywood, whether it hits the stud or not, is gonna get you that ADA load. So three quarter plywood will get you there. Sometimes you don't have the luxury of that. You have an existing tub surround. You don't want to rip out all the tile. You don't want to rebuild all of that. So there's another couple products that are coming on the line. And this is the Wingets. And there's other products that do this now, but Wingets is the one that kind of invented this. So I like to give them a little credit. Now you can get these things on Amazon and Home Depot. Amazon, you know, call Amazon, it comes to your house. Great. One less thing to deal with. And Wingets actually are rated that they can go through an existing tile and sheetrock wall, it's a half inch sheetrock even, and what you do is you get the little diamond drill, buy the diamond drill bit for them to get through tile so you don't crack it, drills the hole, and it's kind of like those old fashioned molly screws, before we had drywall anchors, you had those molly screws, remember those? And you drill the hole and you stuck it in, and as you tightened up the screw, it deployed these little wings. And that's what the wing it does. So as you deploy it, it anchors to the back side of that wall. And then you can put the bracket for the grab bar onto that and attach the grab bar to the bracket and you're home free. So these are fabulous products to easily retrofit and put them in. The other thing is maybe you don't want to do a permanently installed one or it's not available or you can't do that. They do have these little suction cup grab bars. And the suction cup grab bars, some work better than others. If you're not sure it's safe for mom, stick it to the wall, hang on it, pick up your knees. Maybe put a pillow down first <laughs> in case it does decide to come off there. And give it a few good swings. I mean, none of us weigh 500 pounds. So maybe, you know, stack up all the grandkids and just let them go at that thing. One of the things that if you are using the suction cup ones, don't put it over grout lines. You put it over a grout line. You're not gonna get full adhesion with that one. And a lot of these do meet ADA standards. You need to read the packaging. If it says it's ADA, Accessibility Guideline Compliant, that meets the standards. Make sure you're installing it as the manufacturer recommends. The other bathroom element, the toilet. Now whether this is the half bath, the full bath, the toilets. And a lot of times, reconfiguring a toilet is not hideously expensive, and this is one of the major problems that people have trying to use their houses. So maybe it's in that little tiny toilet room, rip out that wall, then you got full access to it, or cut it down to a half wall so a caregiver can assist. But the toilet itself, you may wanna replace it. If you have some of those ones, I swear you go in these old houses, those toilets, they're like 11 inches off the ground. I don't know, were we that much shorter? I don't know. Or Porcelain just cost a lot, so they're, they're almost a pit toilet. And so then the new standard heights are a little higher, but now they're not wheelchair toilets. The marketing people call them comfort height. So the comfort height toilet, which I don't know why we haven't been doing this all along. Anybody here have one? It's life-changing, isn't it? Especially if you have any issues. It's wonderful. <laughs> so you could just shift it out and put in the higher toilet. That might work. If you are gonna do a little more plumbing, you've got the money to do a little plumbing re remodel, wall hung. Wall hung is your friend because the new properly installed ones like Geberit, if you buy the Geberit ones, it's a steel frame that nails in there. This thing is on there. Unless you have like a 900 pound person, you're good to go. But the beauty of wall hung is if you have any accidents and they miss, it's a whole lot easier to clean up that floor very quickly. You're not having to get all around the bottoms of the commodes and all those weird little things that they put on there. And you can do something like that. And so a lot of manufacturers are making these little toilet seats. And you slap it onto a standard toilet. They do require an electrical plug. So you may have to have a GFI, a ground fault plug, installed next to the toilet. And you plug them in, and then they connect to the water supply line coming in for the toilet. And the beauty thing of this is they have little water heaters. When I first heard about this, I thought, I do not want to get hit there with ice cold water in the winter in Texas. They're kind of like the on-demand water heaters. So you have warm, it has front water, it has rear water. Figure it out. <laughs> they have air dryers. 
<laughs> and they even have heated seats, which, hey, this last winter in Texas, that could have been nice. <laughs> so you see these kinds of little devices. That's a wonderful thing to add on to make it, again, more usable, that somebody can extend the lifespan. And if you really want to go the bigger bucks, the manufacturers are combining all in one that you have these. It's basically a combination of a bidet and a toilet. And unlike the European one, you don't have to figure out which way to get on the thing. You're already there. So you kind of get that going there. And again, makes it easier. And then be mindful of the slip resistance of the floor. If you're redoing flooring, ask for the manufacturer's specifications for what is the slip resistance factor. Now, the industry is going through huge changes. What we always used before was the coefficient of friction. Coefficient of friction for ADA had to be a 0.6. For wet areas was 0.8. Coefficient of friction basically goes from 0.0 to 1.0. 1.0 being rubber on rubber, and then 0.0 being oil on ice. Okay, so 0.6 and 0.8. They're changing these tests, but usually if it's like the Germans have a different test, we're developing new tests because of all this, check the slip resistance and the more grout lines, the more slip resistant. So those big 36 by 36 tiles, be careful. Maybe you want to go with mosaic tiles on the flooring because it gives you a lot more adhesion. And so pay attention to that. And then if you are putting those rubber strips down, make sure that they are permanently attached so that it's not that rubber. My mother, she makes me crazy, I know, mother of a designer. And she has that stupid rubber mat in the tub shower. And I'm just waiting for her to step in and have it slide. Because they don't always stick. So be careful with those kinds of things. Make sure they are adhered. And then another weird thing a lot of people don't think of in the bathroom is refrigeration. A lot of manufacturers now are looking at refrigeration for the bathroom because a lot of medications are requiring this. A lot more medications. So there are actually manufacturers that make a medicine cabinet that actually has refrigeration. And they're actually making little pull-out refrigerators that are 15 inches wide that you can put in a standard cabinet. So that may be something you want to add into that. And then if you are designing, again, for aging in place, if you have a connected home, a monitored home, make sure that you've got an alarm switch in the bathroom and make sure that it's either down on the floor or has a pull chain that goes all the way down to the floor so that somebody can access it. So we've covered getting into the house. We've covered getting through the house, the doors, and we've covered at least having a bathroom you can use. But there's a lot of really easy things you can do to make things more accessible. Lever-style doorknobs. Just go around and change out the doorknobs and put the lever-style. If somebody has mobility issues, much easier. Or I don't know about you, I always put hand lotion on and then need to open a door. Can't do it. Uh, so that's a big one. Rocker-style light switches. Instead of the toggles, the rockers are a little easier because you can literally just lean against them. And then take it to the next level, get the illuminated switches. If you're dealing with people that are starting to get forgetful, they see that glowing light switch across the room. And it's a lot easier to find. So something simple like that. What we call D and C style cabinet hardware. Knobs can be difficult for people when they start having grasping problems. So if it's kind of D shaped or C shaped, it's a little easier for somebody to grasp with arthritis. And then the touchless faucet sinks are also hugely beneficial. Uh, that if somebody has problems, so these work for everybody. Guy with greasy hands, girl with gunky hands, kid with sticky hands, somebody with hands that don't bend. These touchless faucets, and they work. These are not like those stupid things at the airport that you have to do that like kung fu dance in front of. These actually work. <laughs> so they're really helpful and easy to install. And so one of the big things is vision. As we get older, two of the biggest senses that we start to lose are vision and hearing. And so vision, if you want to add some extra uh, safety for that, because low vision affects about 1 in 28 Americans older than 40. So pretty much 1 in 28 of us has vision or higher. And so you want to pay attention to things like adding additional lighting. I mean, I don't know about y'all, I have enough light bulbs. I think you can see me through space from the inside of my house. So adding additional lighting, adding additional natural lighting. Maybe you want to add a window. Adding a couple of windows, not hideously expensive in the renovation world, and you can add some more natural light to the space. Remove trip hazards. This is one of the biggest things. When people fall, that's usually the game ender. 
If they have a serious injury, they're more likely to fall again. They're more likely to be institutionalized early on because of this one. So furniture in hallways, get rid of it. Those little tables, get rid of those. Rugs, I know we're going to be prying my mom's rugs out of her cold, dead hands. And I've seen her almost kill herself on the thing a number of times. So if they insist on it, make sure that the edges are taped down and as secure as possible. Loose electrical cords, all those kinds of things. Um, you may want to change the colors of the walls because the color can indicate a lot of things to people. You know, so when they see the color change, maybe there's a flooring level change. Maybe there's a turn change. So just painting the color as a wayfinding tool is huge, or replacing the flooring so that I'm walking on wood, I'm walking on wood, now I'm on tile. Shoot, I'm in the wrong room. So things like that can subconsciously help people that have uh, issues with that. And fire safety, bedroom egress, baseboard markers, emergency lights. Don't be afraid to put emergency, commercial emergency lights inside, tied into an alarm system so that if they go off, they can help somebody get out there. So all of those things come into play. And then the other one, a lot of us think of eyes. I don't know. It's easier for me, maybe because I'm a visual person, to maybe think about what the world would be like and changes I need to make for vision. People don't think of hearing. And my dad is my guinea pig for this. Mom's blind, dad's deaf. I have a, a whole little learning laboratory in our family. And so safety for the hearing impaired, my number one, if you have people, especially if they're living on their own, that have hearing issues, what do they do before they go to sleep? Take off the hearing aid. What happens if the fire alarm goes off in the middle of the night? Not good. So there are fire alarms that attach to the beds and will vibrate the bed. And they also work in conjunction with lights and strobe lights that come on to, again, give another cue once they wake up. That's a big one. Visual doorbells. They have doorbells now that somebody rings the doorbell, they can pick up their phone and see who's there because it has a camera built into it. Uh, exterior motion detectors. They can't hear if somebody's creeping around in the yard. If somebody's creeping around the yard, it sets off a motion detector, they get an alarm, they can check the cameras from their phone, their TV, you can set all that up, or they can just look out the window. So all those kinds of things. And then a word about kitchens, quickly. <laughs> Other than bathrooms, kitchens are probably the most challenging accessibility area in a house. And how many of you have put your parents on appliance probation? Yeah, dad's been on since, I don't know, 1984. Uh, so there's a lot of things that you can do to make more access, access in a kitchen. A lot of design elements can be incorporated to make the kitchen more intelligent. Uh, for example, my mom, she's not in a wheelchair, but she's five foot one, I know. Nobody believes it when they see us side by side. And after a lifetime of reaching up, I noticed she couldn't get anything out of the upper cabinets. Her shoulders are kind of frozen and with arthritis. We have really bad arthritis. She couldn't get anything out of the upper cabinets. So you can install these little things here in an upper cabinet. They come in standard width, standard 12-inch depth. And you put them in there. You screw them into the back wall. And with one finger, you go like this, and everything comes down. Don't need electricity. Don't have to rewire the whole house. So that's a great insert that you can use for something like that. Uh, it check the capacity of the one that you're thinking of purchasing. If you're going to put this in the cabinet and fill it with soup cans, make sure it's a higher weight capacity. If it's going to be cereal boxes, not so much. Spend the money where you need the money. Don't spend the money and overbuy on these things. Drawers. Anybody doing new kitchen design, drawers are the darling of the kitchen. Why we didn't always put drawers below the counter, I don't know. Because I don't know about y'all, but getting stuff out of that lower cabinet, A, my back doesn't work. B, I wear bifocals. I have to put my glasses on upside down to see what's in there. Or get down on the floor and wait for somebody to get me back up. <laughs> so drawers. And you can add drawer cabinets, pull out some of the base cabinets, and add some drawer units in there if you wanted to put that in there. Another thing are just these kind of pullouts. So any kind of pullout that you can think of makes it easier. Add organization to kitchen, you extend the use of that kitchen. So everything you can think of, there are pullouts for just about every kind of cabinet that you could have for every use that you can have. You have simple ones like this that go into the sinks, under the sinks. You have those little pullouts for those stupid blind corner cabinets. Oh my God, last time I moved out of the house, we were emptying that thing out. I swear people had been coming in my house and leaving donations because I had never seen any of those things. You know, we all have that cabinet. So this makes it a lot more accessible. How about this one? 
Pot racks. Problem with pot racks, A, they're up high, B, your pots get dusty, and C, where the heck are my lids? Now they have ones that are go in the base cabinet, and you keep the lid and the pot together, and it's easy and accessible. Or how about using that oversized D and C hardware that we were talking about? So just switching out, oops, Chris, switching out the hardware. It's a lot more graspable to use there. And another issue with elderly, and we saw it a lot this winter, illness, flu, disease, virus, bacteria. These are all the enemies here. So we have, especially with the elderly and the young, this is transgenerational design. This doesn't just have to be for the old and the aging, but you do have weakened immune systems. And so adding antibacterial adding antibacterial materials, that's hard to say, into the kitchen can help reduce some of that cross-contamination. And there was actually a random study. They went and picked 10 houses. They checked six areas in the house. I don't know, if, I, I just picture guys in lab coats knocking on doors going, can we swab your kitchen? And they checked these six areas. And 94% of those kitchens had things like uh, staphylococcus, uh, severe viral and bacterial infections on specifically the dish rag the faucet handles, the refrigerator handles, the stove knobs, the countertops, all those lovely areas, because you touch the raw chicken, you know, bink, 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 it's all over the whole kitchen. And so reducing that, uh, you can change out the countertops and make a huge difference. They're making these, uh, the man-made stone countertops have microban added to them. And it's not a surface applied, it's all the way through that. And if you have bacteria on a microband surface, within 24 hours, the, bac the bacteria will die. If you have bacteria on a non-treated surface, the bacteria will be about 100 times more of them in 24 hours. So something like that can make a difference. They also have a silver ion treated cabinet hardware. So it will kill the bacteria that's left on it without having to be cleaned. You actually have products you can spray on stainless steel appliances that kill any bacteria that comes on them long term. And so how about these, replacing some of the appliances. A dishwasher, where do you put the, heavy, the heaviest things in a dishwasher? Which rack? Anybody here have back problems? Now you combine the back problem, okay, if you got good knees, you can do the squat, right? You have the back problem and the knee problems, you just stare there and look at it. I'm trying to hope it levitates back out of there. So pulling out dishwasher and putting the dishwasher drawers in maybe having two dishwasher drawers that are located higher so you don't have to go all the way down can work for something like that. Other things are replacing the cooking appliances. The cooking, heating, cooking appliances are the number one area. This is what causes the fire. This is what causes people to injure themselves are the cooking appliances. And if you add in memory loss, impairment, things like that, my dad puts the tea kettle of water on the burner, turns it on high, walks away, and forgets about it. He welded a teapot to an electric cooktop. I'm not kidding. We grabbed the hot, pot to, hot pad to pull it off. It uncoiled the burner. Now we have this pop art of an uncoiled electric burner with a teapot welded to the top. Hence, he's back on appliance probation. But now they have ovens that have lockout features. Anybody remember in offices where you had to start putting a code to use the copy, maker, the copy machine? you have a lockout feature, so they have to put the code in order to activate the cooktop or the oven. If they don't have the code, they can't use it. My friend thought just pulling the no knobs off of a stove would be enough. Her father had some dementia problems, and so if you just pulled the knobs off, he couldn't use it, right? Problem is, her dad one day had one of those clear days and remembered where the vice grips were. She came over, he had vice grips snapped onto every single one of them. So this one avoids the cheating. Another thing is consider switching out the cooktop, the cook surface or the range, to an induction range. Induction technology, relatively new, it was invented in 1934. Took a while to catch on. This is the darling of professional chefs. This is the darling of most people in the design industry. This is not a glass electric cooktop. It's a completely different technology. It used magnetic induction instead of thermal radiation. So in other words, you can turn all the burners on high and sit on this thing. As long as you don't have any magnetic material in your backside, you're good. If you do, don't do that. And so the pot becomes the cooking vessel. 
the surface always stays. The, the hottest it'll get is if you have boiling water in something, you set it, move it, you know how you get that hot? That's the hottest it gets. Much safer. So you might want to consider that. Uh, how about wall ovens? Anybody who have double wall ovens? Mm-hmm. Remember my little munchkin mom, five foot one? She wanted the double wall ovens. I didn't want to put them. She made me put them. She opens that top one, leans over, pulls out the stuff. How she has not set herself on fire, I do not know. And so we switched hers out to a side open. The door oven swings to the side. Much safer. And then just cleaning out all the draw drawers and cupboards can get you a lot of the way that you need to go. This is kind of on steroids. <laughs> But it just goes to show that the easier you make things to see and find and organize, the more you can extend the usability of that kitchen. And again, there are inserts for everything. Uh, how much easier to find the spoon in this drawer here where you have those little restaurant pots rather than you all have it, you know the drawer I'm talking about. And there's usually a couple of like knives and things mixed into that drawer just to add to the excitement while the pot's boiling over. So things like that, that can make it a lot easier. Uh, knives, speaking of knives, make sure that knives are securely and easily accessible and stored well. A lot of those knife blocks, be careful. The knife blocks are incredibly top heavy. And so somebody grabs one and the whole thing tips over, knives go flying everywhere, people are impaled, it's never a good thing. So. Make sure that you're doing the knives well. Uh, those magnetic strips are probably the best way to store a knife. And it also is the best thing for your knives to do that. Or the knife drawers, or just putting them inside uh, so that you don't have to worry about a knife block tipping over. Uh, some other things you can do from the knives is you can build them into the cabinets. You can build them into the butcher blocks. They have pop-up knife racks. Make sure those are secured more than anything else in the kitchen. And then technology. How many of you love technology? <laughs> well, y'all, get over it. <laughs> because we got the silver tsunami coming on one side, and we have the tech tsunami coming on the other side. And so this is an interesting area. They have actually developed a brand new field called Jaron Technology. Jaron as in geriatric. And Jaron Technology is an interdisciplinary academic field and professional field, and they're combining gerontology and technology together. And the focus is to develop new innovative ideas, new methods, new products, new construction techniques spe specifically for aging populations. And some of the research outcomes, the data that we're getting from some of the stuff they're doing, we're using in the design and architecture field, builders, product manufacturers, health professionals, because these Jaron technology teams, you'll have somebody there who's an occupational therapist, you'll have a, 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 an immune disease specialist, psychologists, architects, all of these things together. Can you imagine what we can come out with that? So they're realizing they're interrelated. Now one of the things, so we're seeing a lot of coming. This is coming fast. Another area that's kind of interesting though in the mainstream technology that is exploding. I go to the Consumer Electronics Show every January in Las Vegas. Y'all, it's huge. Think about it. anything with a wire that can be sold to a human. It's there. <laughs> They've got it all. But you always see when you go to these huge trade shows, there's usually like two or three dominant things. This is the one that's mainstream, and it is voice controlled. Anybody here have an Alexa or a Google Home? Anybody here use Siri on their phone? And I just, if I just turned on your phone, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the power of the voice is going to be specifically targeted to this market. I'm testing this out on my mom. If, it, if I can get mom to do that, my mom to do that, you, anybody can do this. Trust me. My mom, she's had a cell phone for 10 years. She still does not understand that when the call is over, she does not have to turn the phone off. <laughs> We're working on that. And she's actually doing well with her little Alexa setup. So what can you do? You can control all the lights in the house. You can walk in, or as you're leaving the house, say goodbye, and the house will turn its lights off. You come home, you say hello, it turns its lights on. You can set up to do the thermostat control. So you're sitting there, you're cold, you're hot, you just tell it to change the temperature. You don't have to get up. So if you have mobility issues, or you can't read the thermometers, or the thermostats, you can just tell it what to do. 
the door locks, security cameras, uh, automatic programs. I have mine set so that it goes off automatically every morning by my bed. A lovely chime will sound. It will say, good morning, sunshine, and give me the weather report. But we're seeing the rise of the Internet of Things. And we're getting to the point now, oops, two slides. With the rise of the Internet of Things, we're taking huge leaps forward in home health care where you just go onto the monitor, call your doctor's office, you have a face-to-face -face communication, you do your blood pressure, your sugar, your temperature, all these kinds of things, and it goes directly in your medical record. So the Internet of Things is this massive thing that's going to be coming in the next two years, and all of these things will be coming connected. Part of also having a safer, more accessible living space, so we're fixing the house, you can stay in the house. Well, I'm bored. It's a beautiful day. I want to go outside. So make sure when you're including accessible living space to extend the time that somebody can stay in their house, make sure it's pleasant. Don't forget outside. You have a lot of people that love gardening. Put in some raised gardening beds. Put in some durable pathways. So whether you're doing something, something you can roll a wheelchair over. Doesn't necessarily have to be concrete, but something that you can get outside, get around, do things when you're there, you're going to extend the well-being and the happiness. And also, y'all, when you're dealing with aging people, getting them to move can be a challenge. So getting them out there and getting them moving. So these are some of the simple things. And we haven't even touched on lighting. There's a whole other side to that. Um, so I'm going to just say right now that creating spaces that are safe, functional, and yet still beautiful, they don't have to look like you know hospital anterooms, it's possible. The design and architecture industries are a little behind, but they're catching up to this one. You don't have to necessarily start from scratch. And in the end, everyone wins because good design works for everybody. Now, I'm going to open up the floor. If you have any questions, uh, I know they're going to be sending you to lunch in a few minutes. So if you wanted to uh, have any questions with me outside, great. Anybody have hands up or did I just bore you out of your minds? You're just going to burn the house down, start over. We can do that too. <laughs> Anybody? Oh, dear. Y'all are hungry. <laughs> well, if you do, I'll just be outside the door. Oh, here's a question. Yes, ma'am. So a lot of these things we can get from, like, Home Depot, Lowe's? Okay. Pretty much everything that I was talking about you can get from Amazon, Home Depot, Lowe's, okay. uh, mainline distributors. You don't have to find some weird specialty place. Amazon is a huge one. They've got everything. I wanted to ask whoa, how, um, how you might, uh, if you think you need these, if you could use Medicare or insurance to help pay for them. That gets a little tricky because Medicare and insurance usually only cover if it's a durable medical equipment and there's an enormous gray zone. So it's almost done on an individual basis. Um, if you're dealing with military veterans, that is an avenue worth pursuing because they're adding more benefits for the military veterans and disabled veterans that can extend into some of the aging as well. We did that for my dad. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to ask what the name of that uh, pull-out cabinet was from the top. Uh, that pull-down cabinet is the Pegasus Lift by a cabinet uh, manufacturer called Hafela. It's a German company, H-A-F-E with the little dots over it, L-E. And it's the Pegasus Lift. Uh, Revolift, um, Revashelf, R-E-V hyphen A hyphen shelf, also has a lot. They're a little less expensive than Hafala. Hafala is kind of like top of the line, and Revashelf is more in the middle, but very, very good products. And so those two are both worth getting their catalogs for. Yes. Hi. Um, very interesting talk, so thank you for being thank you. here. Um, I have learned that um, in order to find out, because as a family caregiver, and I've been one for 10 years, uh, we don't think of these things, so, so it's like amazing that you're talking about this. So, but I did learn that if you, as a family caregiver, request of the doctor a home safety assessment, supposedly a nurse and a therapist right. and somebody else. The biggest is one to you come want out. is the occupational therapist. Oh, right, exactly. And that's occupational who comes therapists out. are the ones that you want to do the home evaluation because. You know, you may have put the grab bar here for the shower entry, and then if they have a stroke and reduced strength in that side, you actually need it over here. How to step into things, the OTs are the ones that can help you more with exactly. that. And there are occupational therapists that I have taught 
that our Certified Aging in Place Specialist, which is yes. the CAPS designation, C-A-P-S, and it's a designation through the National Home Builders Association, the NAHB, and if you go on the NAHB website, you'll find all the CAPS certified people in your area. Okay. And if you find an OT who's CAPS, Excellent. So I encourage all family caregivers, even if you don't think you need to change anything, yep. request that. Fresh and, eyes. And then, you know, you can, oh, you can mm -hmm. mention, oh, well, well, Lynn Wilkinson said. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, we're, uh, I'm doing a lot of consulting nowadays where I'm kind of going through and doing exactly that. Because people are capable of making the changes themselves, but they just don't know what those changes need to be. So get some evaluation, get some fresh eyes if that helps you out. Definitely. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Boy, she's fast with that mic. <laughs> Can you assume then that if you go into, uh, if you put your family member in a, uh, assisted living that it meets all of these requirements? Assisted living care are required by federal law, ADA federal law, to meet the ADA accessibility guideline standards. It is a public commercial space. But it's interesting, I still go into some of those facilities and while they do the checklist and they meet the code and they're code compliant, it's not necessarily the best way to have handled it. So they are safe, they are code compliant, uh, but it may not be the most aesthetically pleasing or the most easily functional, but it does meet the, met it has to meet the federal law because it is a commercial space. Yes. Anybody else? I've stumped you all. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can everybody give her a hand?